Okay, so question four. The questions are define health management. Who is a health manager? What are the qualities of a good health manager? What are the functions of a health manager? What are the barriers to quality health care in Nigeria? So I'll answer the questions briefly and then go on to elaborate on the points afterwards. So define health management. Health management is a process of organizing, coordinating, and monitoring the work of healthcare employees in a healthcare setting to ensure that safe and effective quality care is provided to the patients seeking medical care. Who is a health manager? A health manager is a person who has acquired the knowledge, skills, and qualifications to allocate human and material resources and direct the operations of a healthcare department or an entire organization. So what are the qualities of a good health manager? He must be able to make effective decision with good judgment. He will be analytical and detail-oriented, highly adaptable or flexible, exceptional, must have exceptional communication and interpersonal skills, must have extensive knowledge of healthcare systems and regulations, then be able to creatively solve problems. He must be skilled in developing and managing budgets, then must have strong leadership skills and ability to inspire or motivate the team. What are the functions of a health manager? He's a strategic planner, financial planner, sets agendas and uh, makes policies for the organization. He's in charge of hiring and uh, also in charge of personal training and professional development in terms of human resources management. He's also involved in medical information system and data documentation. He's involved in risk, compliance and conflict management. What are the barriers of quality healthcare in Nigeria? Healthcare in Nigeria, one, is not a national priority. There's lack of funding to build and maintain infrastructure, that's health infrastructure. Then there's ad inadequate allocation of financial resources to the health sector. There's lack of access to basic healthcare services, especially in the rural areas. Then we have shortage of healthcare facilities, medical professionals, and essential equipment. Then again, we have overburdened medical personnel with poor incentives in terms of salaries. Then healthcare in Nigeria, it's too expensive for the average Nigerian. So health management is also called healthcare management or healthcare administration. So there are two terms here, health and management or healthcare and management. Management involves organizing coordinating and monitoring the work and actions of a group of people. WHO simply defines it as getting things done through people. So there are two concepts here. One, getting things done. Then two, through people. So healthcare on its own is a process of providing medical services to improve the health of individuals. So defining health management would be the process of organizing, coordinating, and monitoring the work of healthcare employees in a healthcare setting to ensure that safe and effective quality care is provided to patients seeking medical care. So the two concepts are imbibed here, the employees and then provision of safe and effective quality care to patients. What is health management continued? It combines the clinical care of patients and the business aspects of healthcare as well. So there's collaboration of various departments of the health facilities to ensure efficient use of resources, to hire qualified medical and non-medical staff, ensuring financial stability, acquisition of medical devices and so on. So as the name implies, is the overall management of a healthcare facility, which could be a clinic 
or hospital. Now, a health manager is a person who has acquired the knowledge, skills, and qualifications to manage a health facility. So he's the one who is in charge of ensuring that the facility is running as it should in terms of um, in terms of budget, the goals of the facility, and then the practitioner's goals and ensures that the facility meets the needs of the community. He oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the facility. He likewise collaborates with employees, other staff to ensure the facility meets their goals. He makes decisions about performance evaluations, staff expectations, budgeting, and billing. He acts as a spokesperson, providing information to the organization and to the public at large. So the qualities of a good manager, I already listed that earlier, so I'll describe each one. One, he must be able to make effective decisions with good judgment. As a healthcare manager, he makes decisions daily, and this would need he would need to carefully weigh options before making such decisions for the organization that he's managing. Two, he must be able to solve problems creatively because often they are faced with tough decisions and complex problems. So the best ones rise to the occasion with their exceptional decision-making and problem-solving problem abilities. So these managers have a knack for generating creative solutions. They think outside the box to tackle challenges in innovative ways. They also possess strong analytical skills, allowing them to collect and analyze data to identify key factors in the organization and make informed decisions. Since they usually oversee finances, accounting, um, scheduling of work and billing, including data collection, extreme attention to detail is required. They're also skilled in developing and managing budgets. They must have a knack for crunching numbers and allocating resources effectively. By creating comprehensive budgets, they ensure that the hospital operates smoothly and efficiently. A good health manager must be highly adaptable and flexible because the duties of a health manager can look very different each day. They're not stereotypical as their tax and situations and expectations may change depending on the situation or circumstance. In order to succeed, they need to be highly adaptable and they will need to be able to juggle um, between tax and deadlines. Also in a healthcare setting, effective communication is critical because the nature of healthcare requires that the managers are people oriented and comfortable working with, communicating with and teaching people. So the best health managers excel at both verbal and non-verbal communication. They know how to convey information clearly and concisely, ensuring that everyone understands what needs to be done. They are also um, active listeners who value the opinions and concerns of their team members, thereby they foster a culture of open dialogue and empathy. So they are skilled also in, in conflict resolution and mediation, handling disagreements, you know, and trying to find solutions to satisfy the people involved. They must be well versed in the complex world of healthcare systems and regulations. So the best among them possess a deep understanding of healthcare policies and regulations, ensuring that their facility operates within the law and, pro and provides the highest level of care. Again, the best healthcare managers possess strong leadership skills that inspire their team to greatness. They lead by example, showing their team what um, hard work, dedication, and compassion is all about. 
They also establish clear goals and expectations, ensuring that everyone is on the same on the same page and working towards a common purpose. Okay. Functions of a manager. There are 10 managerial roles identified by Henry Mitzberg, as you can see here, and they are known as figurehead, leader, license, monitor, disseminator, spokesman, negotiator, disturbance, handler, entrepreneur, and resource allocator roles. Furthermore, he grouped the 10 roles into three key areas, interpersonal, informational, and decisional. Interpersonal roles cover the relationships that a manager has to have with others. The three roles that a manager has to have within this category are figurehead, leader, and license. So managers have to act as figureheads because of their formal authority and symbolic position representing their organizations. As leaders, they bring together the needs of an organization and those of the individuals under their command. So the third interpersonal role, that of license, deals with professional networking. A manager has to maintain you know, a network of relationships outside the organization on behalf of the organization. Okay, then under informational, managers have to collect, you know, disseminate and transmit information. So they have three corresponding informational rules as a monitor, disseminator, and spokesperson. So a manager monitors what goes on in the organization, receiving information about both external and internal events. Then he transmits this to others concerned. This process of transmission is a dissemination rule, passing on information of both the factual and value kind. Uh, a manager often has to give information concerning the organization to outsiders. So taking on the role of a spokesperson to both the general public and those in positions of um, influence. The most crucial part of managerial activity is that concerned with making decisions the four roles in this category are entrepreneur, disturbance handler, resource allocator, and negotiator. An entrepreneur is someone who finds new ways of doing things. Thus, as entrepreneurs, managers make decisions about changing what is happening in an organization, of course, in a positive way. They may have both to you know, initiate the change and take an active part in deciding exactly what is to be done. So in principle, they are acting voluntarily here. This is different from their role as the stubborn handler, where managers have to make decisions which arise from events beyond their control. And uh, these events are unpredicted. So the ability to react to such events as well as to plan activities is an important managerial skill. So when an organizational team hits a roadblock, for instance, it's the manager who must take charge. And as a disturbance handler, he will also need to help mediate disputes. So the resource allocation rule of a manager is central. Clearly, a manager has to make decisions about um, allocation of funds, money, people, equipment, time, and so on. In doing so, the manager is actually scheduling time, programming work, and authorizing actions. The negotiation role is put in a decisional category because a manager has to negotiate with others, and in the process of, uh, and in the process, he makes decisions about the commitment of organizational resources. For instance, he can be negotiating for new contracts or approval of a new computer system or laboratory um, equipment. Um, specific functions of a health manager. A health manager, um, as a strategic planner, is responsible for 
efficient administration of medical and healthcare services. Even though his job does not involve direct patient care, instead he plans, directs, analyzes, coordinates services with the aim of making operations as smooth as possible. So as a strategic planner, he carries out a comprehensive analysis of the organization's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So this analysis is used to identify areas of improvement and develop um, strategies to help the organization achieve its goals. He's also involved in financial planning, which include planning budgets, establishing service rates, authorizing expenditures, and coordinating financial reports. So they keep a close eye on the financial performance of the institution. They track revenue and expenses, analyze financial reports, identify areas of improvement. So by monitoring financial performance, they can make informed decisions that benefits both the hospital and the patients. Health managers also make direct policies at their level of responsibility, ensuring that these policies remain in synchrony with the vision and goals of the organization they manage. They supervise, conduct recruitment of staff, hiring, scheduling. Sorry, Dr. Ifoma, you, you need to round up in two minutes so that we can people can contribute. Okay. So the other roles or functions would be administrative personnel training and professional development. They are also in charge of medical information system, data documentation. They are risk takers. They ensure compliance to, to duties and responsibilities, and they also manage conflict. So the barriers to quality health care, uh, one is that health care is not a national priority here in Nigeria because according to WHO ranking anyway, among 191 countries, we rank 187. We're only four spots away from the bottom. Then there's lack of funding to build um, and maintain health infrastructure. The available health infrastructure are not even sufficient to meet the needs of the vast and growing Nigerian population. Again, there's low funding from various tiers of government, which has led to inadequate health infrastructural facilities. Then there's lack of access to basic care, especially in the rural areas, with shortage of healthcare facilities, medical professionals, and equipment as well. The few medical personnel available are already overburdened with poor incentives as well. The healthcare in Nigeria is funded out of pocket by individuals. So this makes um, healthcare accessibility quite expensive. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Roma. So the class is open for comments, contributions. Um, you can raise your hand electronically and make your contributions or you type in the chat box. Um, Dr. Araga, please um, start preparing to share your screen. So the floor is open. Any any contributions? Any any comments? Any clarifications? from the chat box there thank you for an excellent presentation dr jamila dr Ekele. any other contributions To our teachers. Dr. Ede, thank you so much. It was a lucid presentation. She did well. She did from my end, she did justice to the question. Thank you so much. 
I don't know if our chief, Chief Cookie, Chief Chitu, Chief Remigus, Chief Manzi, I don't know if they have any comment to the Fatima, to the Kopi, to the Jennifer. These are our facilitators. Good morning, Dr. Chief Adam. Morning, sir. Yes. Uh, what's up with your voice? Don't tell me you've caught this flu that is going around. Well, you know, I've had it for more than two weeks, actually. <laughs> well, eh? Everybody is having mm -hmm. it this day. Okay, so um, I know that this is a topic that most people don't really identify with, but um, it's one of those things that National, National College will definitely ask at some point, okay? So it's important to understand some of these concepts. Now, all the things you said are all the things that you need to know as a health manager or to know about health management, but know that it is still a manager is a manager. The only thing is that we're putting it in the context of a hospital or a clinic, okay? Now, all of us here are managers, okay? Some of you ask me how. All of us manage our homes, okay? So if you're a manager in your home, you're doing all the things that he has said, okay? When your salary comes in at some point, you're doing resource allocation, right? You're making decisions on staff recruitment, okay? Uh -huh. You can recruit a gardener, recruit a housekeeper, and all of that, okay? And then, of course, uh, you can increase the size of your organization when you start having uh, kids, okay? And, of course, when you're having kids, you're sending them out for training in form of getting them to have an education, okay? And, of course, they're also contributing to the home. So all the concepts you mentioned here, okay, just think about it in the concept of the house. and uh, a family setting, and of course, the head of the family is the manager, so to speak, right? So even think about it, eh? conflict resolution. I'm sure some of you have separated your kids from fighting this morning or something, all right? That is part of conflict resolution. So you can just use your basic primary nuclear family to look at these concepts of management. And you can use that to remember basically everything. So even if you forget in the exam hall, just think about your home and all the things you do inside your home. And you can come up with all these concepts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your contribution. Thank you, Any sir. Any other contribution? Dr. Araga, can you, um, Dr. Ifoma, can you un share your screen so that Dr. Araga can share his screen? Thank you. While we are waiting, if you have any contribution, you can go ahead. Dr. Fatima, you can go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, good morning, my chiefs. Good morning, all participants. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ifoma, for that excellent presentation. Um, mine is just a, um, a contribution, yeah. Um, when you want to look at the barriers to health uh, care in Nigeria, you can uh, think of grouping them into uh, different levels from the um, uh, patient level from the uh, doctor's level and also at uh, that is profession level, then also from the um, policy makers level. For instance, from the patients, patients, um, some of them, they have poor attitude of accessing the healthcare, um, issue of um, uh, poverty, and also uh, poor transportation from the um, policy makers, they have poor access to transportation, uh, poor funding, as you rightly said. Then at profession level, um, we, the healthcare providers, are uh, attitude. So if you group them into different levels, you may be able to remember more points. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you Ma, for the contribution. So in the absence of any other, Dr. Araga, can you, can you start the presentation? Dr. Araga. Okay, Dr. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So, good morning, our teachers, uh, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um, Dr. Saraga, and I'll be taking uh, question 2A of the April 2023 West African College uh, WACP exams, general medicine exams. So, the question goes, a 55 year old man traveled from Ghana to USA. He subsequently complained of being unwell with complaints of fever, jaundice, generalized weakness, anosmia, and oliguria. His HbA was his hemoglobin was 7.8 grams per year. Urea was 11 millimoles per liter elevated. Creatinine was 225 micromole per liter elevated. The first question is, what is the diagnosis? What is the pathophysiology? What other investigations will you request? And what do you expect to find? How will you manage this patient? So from the question, my diagnosis is COVID-19 infection with acute kidney injury because the patient presented with, he traveled from Ghana to USA, had anosmia, fever, and had malaise with jaundice, and then also had um, elevated uh, urea and creatinine. So I thought the diagnosis would be COVID-19 infection with acute kidney injury. Possible differentials will include severe sepsis. Of course, the patient had fever, malaise, and also had uh, jaundice. So you could as well have, have had severe sepsis. Acute viral hepatitis could also be a differential because of jaundice and uh, fever that the patient had and malaria as well. Severe malaria, given the fact, although it wasn't mentioned whether it's a Caucasian that visited and traveled back, I thought, okay, it's a possibility that uh, someone travels to malaria endemic area, we could have severe malaria as well. That could have presented that way. So the next question was, what is the pathophysiology? Coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19 for short is a disease caused by infection with a SARS-CoV-2 virus and has represented one of the greatest challenges humanity has faced in recent times. The virus can infect a large number of organs, including the lungs, the upper respiratory tract, the brain, the liver, kidneys, and intestine, among many others, like an index patient, the kidneys, the liver, and some other organs were affected. And so depending on the distribution of the angiotensin to receptor, this virus can affect different organs. Although the greatest damage occurs in the lungs, the kidneys are not exempt. An acute kidney injury, AKI, can occur in patients with COVID-19. Indeed, AKI is one of the most frequent and serious organic complications of COVID-19. Literature reports that COVID-19 AKI is likely to affect greater than 20% of hospitalized patients and greater than 50% of 
such patients that are admitted into ICU. The incidence of COVID-19 AKI varies widely and the exact mechanisms of how the virus damages the kidney are still unknown. Although some postulations are now a quick look at the virus itself. I'll just summarize because we already had a robust presentation on COVID-19 some days ago. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus has four well-identified structural proteins, which are the spike glycoprotein S, a small envelope glycoprotein E, the membrane glycoprotein M, and the nucleocapsid protein N. The S protein is divided into two subunits called S1 and S2 and forms homo trimers that protrude from the viral surface. Remarkably, the S protein mediates viral entry into the host cell by first binding to the angiotensin II converting enzyme receptor through the receptor binding domain that is part of the S1 subunit. And then the S2 subunit fuses the, with the membrane of the virus and the host cell. Meanwhile, the N protein binds to, that is the nucleocapsid protein, binds to the RNA of the virus and participates in the process related to viral replication cycle and the response of the infected cell, the host response. So the N protein stabilizes the complex between the N protein and the viral RNA and promotes the completion of the viral assembly. And lastly, Protein E, which is the envelope protein, plays a role in virus production and maturation. So that's the structure of the coronavirus with uh, the four different proteins. It has been reported that the kidney is one of the organs that most ex expresses AC in a uh, two receptors and that the renal cells with the highest expression are the proximal tubular cells and to a lesser extent, the podocytes. So SARS-CoV-2 protein S was found to partially co-localize with ACE2 in tubules and parietal cells from kidney biopsy samples in the urine and in urine sediment cells. Furthermore, post-mortem analysis of COVID-19 patients found that they had ACE2 upregulation in the kidney relative to people without COVID-19. So there's an upregulation, increased expression of these ACE receptors in a setting of COVID-19 infection. So in the report from 21 autopsies mentioned the presence of Viral RNA is 66.6% .6 of the kidneys. That shows that the kidneys are highly vulnerable to COVID-19 uh, complications. With all this background, it is clear that the kidney, the kidney can be greatly infected and can also act as a reservoir for the virus. The pathophysiology of COVID-19 AKI is thought to be multifactorial one of which is shows that it involves the direct effect of the virus on the kidney, also cardiovascular comorbidities, local and systemic inflammatory response, what is called COVID-19 cytokine storm, and immune responses, endothelial injury, and activation of coagulation pathways and microvascular disease. Dehydration can also contribute to AKI in this setting, as well as superimposed sepsis mediated hypotension and the renin angiotensin system. As noted above, the cytopathic effect of SARS-CoV-2 on the podocyte and proximal tubule cells might be associated with the development of COVID-19 AKI, especially in patients with sepsis, and also more so in patients that already have background chronic kidney disease. Additionally, SARS-CoV-2 can directly infect the renal tubular epithelium and podocyte through an angiotensin converting enzyme two dependent pathway and cause mitochondrial dysfunction, acute tubular necrosis, the formation of protein reabsorption vacuoles, encouraging proteinuria, collapsing glomerulo, glomerulopathy and protein leakage in Bauman's capsule. So that's just a schema showing uh, the different pathways that COVID-19 
can lead to AKI. You have the endothelial damage, of course, that will encourage uh, coagulation uh, within the vessels. And also have uh, injury to the, of course, AC2 receptors are also distributed found on the muscle. So rhabdomyolysis and myoglobin can also be released, causing damage to the kidneys. So there are other different pathways uh, that are shown and as already explained above. So likewise, the presence of viral particles in the relar endothelial cell has been reported suggesting that viremia may also cause endothelial damage and that promotes vasoconstriction, a state of hypercoagulability and macrophage activation leading to formation of microthrombi and renal microvascular injury. So furthermore, the loss of functional nephrons after injury could increase the development of renal fibrosis in the long term. Meanwhile, COVID-19 pneumonia can cause right ventricular failure and lead to renal congestion, while left ventricular dysfunction can lead to hypotension, decreased cardiac output, and hypoperfusion of the kidneys, which can lead to pre-renal AKI. Severe COVID-19 can cause skeletal muscle damage, which I mentioned earlier, and causing tubular obstruction and tubular toxicity related to ion release. Of course, during intervention in the management of patients with COVID-19 may require, especially for severe cases, may require ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And this has been said that could contribute to AKI by promoting venous congestion increased risks of secondary uh, infections, hemodialysis, hemolysis, sorry, major bleeding and inflammation. Furthermore, excessive positive pressure ventilations of patients that have ventilated, intubated, administered to patients with COVID-19 partially leads to adverse hemodynamic effects of decreased cardiac output, which amplifies renal hypoperfusion. And so a combination of the above mechanisms can contribute to AKI in patients with COVID. And so that's another schema there that shows hypercoagulability and the direct effect of the virus on the kidneys and other mechanisms, hypoperfusion, ECMO, and as well as the effects. Sometimes uh, when all of this could lead to uh, pulmonary congestion, thereby worsening the state and contributing to mortality in patients with COVID-19 AKI. So what other investigations will you request? And what do you expect to find? So I also want to do a chest radiograph. So COVID-19 typically induces an interstitial diffuse uh, bilateral pneumonia with lesions in asymmetrical and patchy distribution involving mainly the lung periphery. So the imaging I like to do, one, the chest radiograph, and these are my findings. Question say, what will you find? So the, it may be normal in early phases of mild disease. There could be consolidation, ground glass opacities, and which are bilateral peripheral and affect mainly the lower lung zone. It could also be spontaneous pneumothorax has also been described, and although it's relatively uncommon. The chest CT can also be done, and also will show ground glass opacification, ground glass opacification with mixed consolidation, adjacent pleural thickening, interlobular septal thickening, and air bronchi. So this uh, picture on the, on the left of the screen is the normal radiograph on the right, you see peripheral uh, uh, opacities and uh, that ground glass uh, opacification on the periphery. And mainly, you can see the lower lung zone mostly affected. So this is a CT scan, a normal CT scan. So in COVID, this is what you could find. Okay. So the arrows showing uh, ground glass opacification mainly around the periphery. Okay, the, another investigation that will help confirm the diagnosis of COVID would be uh, nucleic, nucleic acid amplification test uh, and uh, reverse transcription, which is a form of uh, NAD, can be done for the diagnosis of COVID. Other investigation, I'd like to do a full block count 
uh, where you, 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 you may find lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, even anemia, like in this setting, where the patient had a HB of 7.8 grams per year. Patient already had a, a result of EUC, so I may want to repeat to monitor uh, progress or if the patient's condition is getting worse. Arterial blood gases can also be done. Of course, this patient had a um, jaundice, so evidence of liver involvement. So I want to do a liver function as well. I'll see uh, what is stated there. ESR can also be done. Uh, ESR can also be done. See reactive protein that all these are inflammatory markers. I can show. So blood culture for this patient that has fever, ruler superimposed bacterial infection, especially if the full blood count is suggestive. Elevated lactate dehydrogenase, elevated troponin, elevated creatinine for sokinase, muscles can be damaged, and inflammatory cytokine start looking six, tumor necrosis factor alpha can also be assayed for, as well as D-dimer. We know hypercoagulability can also predispose this patient to uh, uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, DVT. So elevated fibrinogen and the likes there can also be done. So how will you manage this patient? For the treatment of patients with COVID-19 AKI, comprehensive treatment plan should be developed as soon as possible to avoid rapid deterioration of the patient's condition. Multidisciplinary approach is needed and conservative management can be non-pharmacological and pharmacological. The treatment of the and management of patients with COVID-19 AKI is similar to that of patients with AKI associated with sepsis being mainly supportive. So what are the principles that I want to apply in managing this patient? I want to identify and treat underlying etiology, which is in this case is COVID. Determination of volume status of this patient, fluid resuscitation and with isotonic crystalloid and when indicated dextrose containing fluid for uh, calories. Treatments of volume overload with diuretics might be indicated, especially if there's pulmonary congestion. This continuation of nephrotoxic medications is very important, and adjustment of prescribed drugs according to renal function. Additional supportive care measures may include optimizing nutritional status and glycemic control where there are such comorbidities. Renal replacement therapy may be indicated, and uh, Managing of underlying cause, of course, managing is multidisciplinary. So infectious disease specialists, intensivists, pulmonologists, laboratory physician, uh, pharmacists, as all as other members uh, of a medical team can be invited when indicated. So you have to admit this patient to ICU. Oxygen therapy may be required for patients with hypoxemia. So for a uh, treating of etiology, I want to remdesivir, nematrelvir, uh, and retonavir combination can also be done with dose adjustment um, as indicated there. So you may want to reduce the dose to 150 of uh, nematrelvir uh, and 100 milligrams of retonavir instead of the usual 300, 100 milligrams BD. Uh, prescription. Molno private can also be used. And now with limited clinical trial information for COVID-19 patients with advanced CKD and uh, NCD renal kidney disease as well as AKI, few antiviral treatment options currently exist for this population. However, dose adjustment rec is recommended for antiviral agents especially at EGF at less than 30 mils per minute. However, remdesivir has been, has been approved by the European Commission and FDA for use for COVID, COVID treatment with severe renal impairment, including those on dialysis. So it could be used for all stages of uh, renal impairment. So low-dose dexamethasone can also be used. Uh, can also be used. Antipyretics were indicated. Of course, this patient had fever. Investigate for other risk factors for severe disease, like DM. Arterial blood gases can also be a safe, uh, checked for. Strict input and output should be observed. 
fluid management using the previous day output loss, insensible loss to arrive at the fluid management for the day, vaccination when patient is stable. Each of these uh, clinical components can be challenging as clinicians seek to balance the risks and benefits of treatment, such as fluid resuscitation, antiviral medic antibiotics, or bacterial infection, infection and inflammatory medication. If conservative management fails, renal replacement therapy can also be used. Of course, continuous renal replacement therapy is advocated and is preferred uh, in patients with COVID-19 AKI. So I just briefly, uh, like I said earlier, for want of time, and we have already had a discussion on COVID. So I use this outline. The outbreak of coronavirus we has uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Raga, I yes, think we we'll have to give um, time for people to contribute. So, okay. so you, I will share the slides. Share the slides, yes. So oh. um, thank you for your presentation. Um, the class is open for contribution. Comments, questions, clarifications. You can type into the chat box or raise our hands electronically. Hello, Dr. Asa. Can I be heard? Yes, you can be heard, ma'am. Please, participants, comment, please. Comment, comment. Are the ones going for this exam? Please, more comments. Dr. Tani Mohan is up. Dr. Atta, Dr. Tanimu, hands up. Dr. Tanimu, please go ahead. Can I talk? Go ahead, Dr. Tanimu. Okay, thank you very much for this presentation. It's a very good one. In fact, I enjoyed it very well. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, since they give you the edge of the patient, and they also give you the they also give you the creatinine value of the creatinine. If possible, you can calculate the EGFR and see if there is indication for dialysis or something else. Or and also find the severity of the kidney impairment, if possible. Though I exam may not be possible, but for our here for this our discussion, it can be possible for you to calculate the EGR of the patient. And also for the management of, of COVID-19, you have done very good job. Thank you very much. Management Thank depend you. on the management depend on the degree of severity at the presentation. If patient presents and uh, it's, uh, he is stable, but he is found to have COVID positive, uh, COVID-19 uh, assay positive, like nuclear acid application or PC e PCR, and he is stable, then, but he has likelihood of deterioration, then you use Remdesivir uh, as the uh, management plan. He may not need oxygen or something else. But if that patient is also in form of like this one now, but uh, he needs to have supplemental oxygen, maybe he needs to have supplemental oxygen, it is there where you use, or in addition, you use uh, another drug. Uh, I'm just, uh, this bacitrine map uh, or tocilizumab with oxygen supplement. But in addition, if this patient also needs uh, oxygen supplement in form of mechanical, uh, this uh, mechanical ventilation, so there, there, there you also add corticosteroid. So the clinical management of the patient depends on the 
pattern of presentation. Uh, not all the drugs, those drugs are selected based on the severity, whether it is uh, mild or it is patient is COVID-19 positive but, uh, but stable, then that one you use uh, remdesivir. But if it is COVID-19 with was in need of oxygen uh, uh, supplement, but also unstable, then you use uh, tocilizumab uh, uh, with oxygen and also bacitrinamab uh, with uh, oxygen supplement. But if the patient, in addition, need mechanical ventilation, they are where there is a found by the research that is a significant, uh, significant uh, in, uh, increase improvement in mortality when corticosteroid are added. So that is the, the but thank you very much. We also tend to be corrected for those of us who are given contribution for any correction and clarification that may be needed because not all people are 100% 100 percent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Tanimu, for your contribution. Any other contribution? <laughs> so, so there are some questions in the chat, boss. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Ekele said, please, did you mention dexamethasone in the management? Yes, I think he mentioned it at some point, and then Dr. Tanimu mentioned uh, where it is indicated. Uh, what type of AKI is implicated in COVID-19? That's Dr. Success. Is it pre-renal or renal? Then Dr. Yusuf is saying a beautiful presentation. Uh, in examination, you won't have the luxury of time to be calculating EGFR. You can narrow down your treatment to the principle, okay, the principle of management and stay with the question. Then Dr. Dafaru is asking Dr. Tanimu which protocol he is quoting. So those are the questions. So uh, Dr. Araga, the first question okay. is, is it a pre-renal pre or a renal AKI? And okay, then, thank uh, you. Yes, and then Dr. Tanimu, if you are listening, Dr. Jafaru wants a clarification of which protocol you were quoting in terms of the management you just highlighted. All right, um, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, for the, uh, patients with COVID-19, uh, the mechanism of a uh, renal, uh, like we stated earlier, would suggest both uh, pre-renal on renal AKI. For instance, if there's high pop efficient, of course, that will cause uh, pre renal AKI. Okay. And uh, sepsis as well can cause both pre renal and renal AKI, mostly renal AKI. So when there's rhabdomyolysis and other direct effects of the virus, like we mentioned in, uh, in the slides, can also cause renal AKI. So in this setting, it can uh, cause both pre renal and renal AKI. Thank you. So the other, the second question is, uh, what's the second question again, sorry? I think that's what Dr. Tanya No, that's Thank not you. all. There's a question on uh, D-dimer. What is the place of D-dimer estimation in the management of COVID-19? That's okay. from Dr. Uzoke Siri. Then Dr. Oh. Chidima mentioned that pathogen differential should be hemorrhagic and fever. So that's taking note of that. So you can add that mm -hmm. to your list of differentials. It's not there. Then yes. can answer the question from Dr. Siri. Okay. So the, thank you, ma. So the place of um, D dimer, like I mentioned, uh, there's possibility of endothelial injury from uh, COVID nineteen. Okay, so uh, it's risk of hypercoagulability, either from the virus itself or other mechanisms like superimposed bacterial infection. So these patients are at risk of uh, DVT and uh, possible pulmonary embolism. So you you have to uh, assay for D-dimer in this patient. So there's a place for D-dimer. I think I mentioned it slightly. Thank you. Uh, 
كان قاعد سبيك كان قاعد سبيك يس عندهم عندهم صح اوكي ثانك يو فيري ماتش But I am sorry that I cannot remember vividly the the protocol. Uh, but also, what I also want to add is that when you are managing patient, you have to see the specific treat of a specific test or specific investigation test before non-specific ones. For COVID-19, you just see PC and the specific one, polymer theory, I can all this nucleic and the specific ones that we want to arrive as a diagnosis then the uh, ancillary ones the supporting ones so every every time when we are when we are managing patient we're supposed to say the specific test you want to do to arrive at the diagnosis before coming to supportive investigation thank you very much but i could not remember the protocol sir i start to be corrected also thank you very much all right uh, thank you dr tanimo Uh, Dr. Jamila, you have to say something. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, our teachers and the presenter. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted to come. Can you please go to the question? It seems the patient had anemia. Well, I'm not sure. I think I saw the HB. Yes, yes, yes. 7.8. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think in the management, we should also capture... Grouping and cross matching, and then possible transfusion. Of course, bearing in mind the renal impairments, and then watching out for um overloading the patients while transfusing. So I think it's also part important in the management. Then um also um in the full blood counts, I think we should also clearly mention the peripheral blood film. You know, you mentioned the differential as um sepsis, and also in COVID, I'm sure the patients may hemolyze, so we may also pick. Um, something from the peripheral blood film like the schistocytes that may suggest hemolysis. Then I don't know what you think about um, capturing the fact that the patient had jaundice and we also know that the patients could have um, hepatitis. So could that be captured in the diagnosis to maybe COVID-19 complicated by AKI and maybe acute hepatitis? I don't know what you think or what the house thinks about that. Thank you very much. Okay. I, yeah, I think you I mentioned okay. okay, thank Hello, you for Dr. those. Dr. Yes. Okay, thank you for those wonderful contributions. Yes, I the H HB 7.8 grants with that's a very an oversight that I will address when I'm sharing this slide. Thank you for pointing that out. A peripheral blood film, of course, I will add that uh, for the other thing on a hepatitis virus, yes, I added that among the list of differential acute viral hepatitis. So as part of my investigation, I will add um, to assay for those viruses. No, no, I mean in the diagnosis of these patients, is it... What do you think okay. about adding hepatitis, like to capture it holistically, considering the jaundice? Not as a, okay. of course, it's a differential. So, but I mean, in this primary diagnosis now, the way we mentioned complicated by AKI, what do you think about adding the possibility of hepatitis? I don't know. Okay, so, so maybe COVID 19 infection oh. slash uh, hepatitis. Considering uh, myself. Sorry, Dr. Atta. This is the yes, patient. Sir. I want to see if I could uh, uh, weigh in on this. Um, okay, sir. Yeah. Well, if the patient is pale and then is also jaundice, that may lead you to start thinking that is there a form of hemolytic anemia. Um, and I think the fact that he captured other forms of uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers and all of that, that covers that. And then of course, in COVID-19 itself, nothing stops um uh, because of all the immune issues going on, nothing prevents a hemolytic uh, anemia from developing uh, along the line. So I would sway towards that rather than bringing in a whole new organ system into the mix. Although, yes, we do know that COVID-19 is uh, it's a multi-organ disease. So yes, it's uh, whatever is going on may also involve the liver and all of that. But I would sway more towards, uh, well, there could have been hemolysis if there's 
both jaundice and uh, anemia. Uh, also, I wanted to point out something. I, I don't want to rock the whole discussion, but the truth of the matter is you can't make a diagnosis of acute kidney injury with a single creatinine result. As most of the nephrologists in the house would agree with me, all the indicators of acute kidney injury require at least two. So it's either it's rising beyond this or it's falling to a certain level then you can either make it prospectively or retrospectively, as the case may be. So, um, yes, even though the creatinine may suggest the presence of an AKI, okay, it doesn't really, the information given does not confirm the presence of an acute kidney injury. So it's important to note that. If I was in, uh, well, I've, I've spoken uh, to a few people that said this type of question that I would say, uh, and I always point out that, oh, you, well, you know, we can't, can't really make a diagnosis of API with this information. And they would be of the opinion that, okay, at least it can suggest it. And I would say, okay, yes, it can suggest it. So if I was answering the question, I would say uh, there is a suggestion that there may be an acute uh, kidney injury here or there should be a high index of suspicion that the patient is having an acute uh, kidney injury. Then, um, yes, calculation of GFR and all of that, well, you can, but in this scenario, it's not necessary. In an acute kidney injury, calculating the patient's GFR is really not very necessary per se. Rather, you just follow the trend of the uh, creatinine. Um, if the patient, if the AKI persists to become an acute kidney disease and then subsequently lasts more than three months, where it's now where you can now say the patient has a CKD, then yes, you can um, get um, once you once you get the person's uh, uh, stable state um, creatinine, then you can now uh, assess for the um, EGFR. Okay, so um, in the context of this particular question. I wouldn't want to stick my head out to do an EGFR in this patient. And finally, when investigating this patient, please, if you are suggesting that there is an AKI, then there should be serial EUCR done. Don't just say one EUCR. You must do it serially to monitor your patient. Uh, uh, it gets uh, uh, better, of course. You still need to follow up your patient for at least three months well, to be sure that the API again. has completely gone. Yeah. So those, those are the things I just wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for a wonderful contribution, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, let me read some of the chats from the chat box. Um, okay. Um, so, Dr. Maybe we'll for Dr. Tamaka is saying the hemolysis can also explain the jaundice. Okay, say, uh, please, did you mention anticoagulants? Any place for it? Mm. Dr. Rahim saying the diagnosis uh, is COVID-19 with multiple multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Uh, Dr. Paul is saying the radiolog radiographic pattern also describing COVID lung is crazy paving which is a combination of ground glass op opacities and interlobal, interlobal septal uh, thickening seen in other diseases too, like uh, ARDS, lipoid pneumonia, organizing pneumonia, radiation pneumonitis, lymphagitis, carcinomatosis. So those are the comments. So is there a place for anticoagulants in this patient? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, our chief, for this wonderful contribution. Thank you, everyone. Okay, yes, uh, anticoagulants. We'll, we'll have to add that, of course. There's a place for anticoagulants, so I will add that to this slide. It was an omission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, our time is well spent. So, uh, Doctor, our teachers. Who, okay, you hear me. Who handle it? Sorry, yes, sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the 
On the issue of the AKI, yeah, I know Chief Shito has said most of it. Um, well, I know before when we were using only rifle, GFR might be important, but that suggests that you know a baseline. Okay, so and just as he said, you can't make a diagnosis of AKI with just one AUC. There's a background, there's a baseline. You know about the baseline and that was uh, that was there, okay? Especially one that um, has been there. If there's a baseline function, you can refer to it. Say that uh, this patient has AKI, but you will have to monitor. Okay? And then it's very, very key to do. Um, yeah, it, okay, I, I think Rashita has mentioned again also strict input output monitoring. I don't know if you mentioned that. Okay, and then the, the diagnosis could be. Um, I think someone has written that I was also mentioning that multi organ dysfunction. Okay, that might help. Um, they want you to mention because there's already a name. Uh, there's um, um, so, something suggestive of AKI. Um, the lung is affected. You can see that multiple organs are already affected. I, I think this is on this part. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Thanks. very much, sir. Thank you, Chief um, Chief Ramagos. There, our dear teacher. Thank you. But I hope I can be heard. Yes, yes, ma'am, you can be heard. Okay, I want to thank um, the presenter, Dr. Aragach, was a lucid presentation. But I just want to make some, some general comments. Chief, um, I think the participants and our dear teachers have elaborated on the on the stuff aspect of it. So I'll just talk about the general presentation. I noticed that your slides were a little too bulky. We prefer... When you answer the questions, you go straight to the point. You answer, that what is your diagnosis? Straight to the point. What are your differentials? Straight to the point. What are the principles of management? Straight to the point. Then once you're done, if you want to give us a brief overview, fine. At the time, I thought you were doing overview already. Then I now saw uh, something, I think, uh, how you manage this patient. So I said, ah, so you have to, <laughs> you have to this question. I got to move. So please, so that um, the readers, because those going for the exam, they want to quickly flip through or quickly go through the slides. So just, okay, diagnosis is this, management is this, you know, let's make it easy for our participants. But overall, it was a wonderful presentation. You spoke well and then um, had a lot of information. It was a rich slide, so thank you. And I also appreciate the first speaker. That's all for my, my dear sister. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation today. And I also appreciate the participation from the class. Thank you so much. Uh, started in the last discussion, its participation was really interesting. A lot of people were making comments, asking questions, and it was, that was how we knew our dead Dr. Araga didn't uh, add the uh, article gland management. So just like our chief advice yesterday, every participant, especially those going for exam, answer these questions. Have your answers in front of you. If those presenting I'm not answering the way it should be answered. You can say, ah, this oh, you did not talk about this oh. you did not talk about it. You guys are the owners of the class. What we do is just coordinate and yeah, just the way our teachers will come in and say, oh, don't say this in the exam, oh, don't say that. All we do is coordinate and find two more you are saying uh, that the owners of the class. So those, those going for the exam, you need to start hearing your voices. Hey. You are not hearing it enough. Make contributions, ask questions, just as you guys did today. It was, it was really wonderful. Ask questions, 